Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth unto all generations. Certainly we thank God for another expression of his unmeasurable love. We have a God that truly loves us and he has our, our interest at his heart. I think all of us will agree that 2021 has gotten off to somewhat of a stormy start. Uh, as high unemployment, the economy is somewhat sluggish. COVID-19 has gotten worse instead of getting better. There's some problems with the logistics, or logistics rather, of getting the vaccine out. And certainly, last but not least, we have insurrection that uh, visited uh, Washington, D.C. Truly, these are some stormy times. But the God that we serve is able to handle whatever storm that we may encounter in this lifetime. And that's what this message is going to be about today, about how God can handle our storms. Our message will come from a familiar passage of scripture from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, and verse 39. Mark, chapter 4, verse 39. It reads as thus, And he arose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. 
For the next few moments, I want to talk to you from this subject, and that is Jesus can steal the storm. Jesus can steal the storm. No matter what our storms are in this life, and we will meet with some in this life, there is absolutely no storm that Jesus cannot steal. And that's what this message today, and that's what this narrative today is tailored to teach us, is that when it comes to storms, the storms that we cannot handle, we have someone who can handle all of our storms. This narrative today actually begins in verse 35. Jesus had experienced a weather laborious and exhaustive day of uh, performing miracles, teaching, and preaching. And at the end of this day, he was somewhat exhausted. His last message was preached from a ship that um, was on the sea, at the shore of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. Notice I said that he was tired, he was exhausted. He was tired and exhausted on his human side, but his divine side was still refreshed. You see, Jesus has two natures. One is human and the other one is divine. He got his, divine, his human side from his mother and he got his divine side from his father. And throughout his earthly pilgrimage, he exemplified both of these natures. For instance, on his human side, he got thirsty and he drank water. On his divine side, he declared that he is the living water. On his human side, he got hungry and he ate bread. But on his divine side, he said, or he declared that I am the bread of life. On his human side, he got tired, he got weak and weary. But on his divine side, he says, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. On his human side, he prayed until sweat like great drops of blood fell from his forehead. But on his divine side, he said that men ought to always pray. And on his divine side, he was the one who answered prayer. At the end of this laborious and exhaustive day of humanistic energy, Jesus says to his disciples, let us go to the other side. In other words, he gave them a directive. This was his word. And I want you to remember that because we're going to come back to that statement before the end of this message. Jesus said to his disciples again, let us go to the other side. And really that's all they needed was his word because when he spoke that word, no matter what would happen to them between the launching and the landing, they would get to the other side because of the power of his word. Isaiah says that the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Jesus said that heaven and earth may pass away before one tittle of my word shall fail. So they got on board the ship that Jesus was already in, all the disciples. And there was a point here I want to raise. You got to be careful what ship you get on. They got on board the ship that Jesus was on. And so before we get on any ship, let's make sure that Jesus is on board that ship. Whether it's a relationship a friendship, a fellowship, even in our scholarship, make sure that Jesus is on board that ship. That ship disembarked 
from the harbor in Capernaum and you set out on a journey across the, the Sea of Galilee. And somewhere between the launching and the landing, they was hit with a horrific storm. The storm came upon them without giving them any kind of warning. You see, when they left Capernaum, the sun was still shining, the waters were placid, and the winds were calm. But before they got to the other side, a storm hit without warning. Isn't life like that? Well, you see, the Sea of Galilee represents the world. Always turbulent, always some waves coming in, some waves going out, never at rest. And as we live in this world, we got to expect uncertainties. Sometimes things are going our way and sometimes things are not going our way. Job said it best when he said that man born of a woman is of a few days and those days are full of trouble. Job was eluding to storms. And in this life, there are a number of storms allegorically that we can meet with. Storms such as social storms, where we have storms in our relationship. They get to the point where you just can't do anything right. For instance, uh, you make your mate or your significant other or your spouse a cup of coffee and you bring them a warm donut. And then they will complain about the hole <laughs> in the donut. You uh, make breakfast and you want to satisfy your partner, your partner or your spouse or your significant other. And so you uh, prepare two eggs and one of the eggs you scramble and one of the eggs you fry. And you look at the two eggs and they tell you, you scrambled the wrong egg. <laughs> and then there are some times when uh, you may want to go out to dinner, just to have a nice dinner together and just have a good conversation. Only to your chagrin, when you get out, your partner or your significant other or your spouse has got conversation for everybody else, but he or she has none for you. I think that's what B.B. King was alluding to when he said that the thrill <laughs> is gone. That's a stormy social relationship. And then there are financial storms in which you have bills that are stacking up. And it seems like no matter how hard you work, you just can't seem to pull your head above the financial waters. You work two jobs. You work overtime. You work double time. You even become creative and then sell back vacation time. But when you check your bank account, it seems like there's a hole in your bag. It's like putting your money in a bag with holes in it. That is a financial storm. And then there are other storms, whereas it involves your health, where you get sick, and you go to doctor after doctor, you take medication after medication, and instead of you getting better, you get worse. That's what you call um, a illness storm. So there are many, many storms in this life that we may encounter, but no matter what storm you encounter, Jesus can handle your storm. Now, I want to admit that there are some storms that we will encounter in this life that we can handle ourselves. But then there are the perfect storms that none of us can handle. No matter what you try, no matter what you know, no matter who your hookups are, there are some storms that you just can not handle. These disciples in this narrative even though they had 
maritime skill. They was very familiar with these waters on the Sea of Galilee. And this wasn't the first storm that they had encountered on these waters. But this was the first perfect storm. They tried all that they knew to try to overcome this storm. They tried lowering the sails, lowering the mast. They tried putting the oars in the water and rowing in the direction that they desired to go. They tried bailing water as water began to come over in the ship and fill the ship up, but to no avail. This was a storm that they could not handle. And when we get the storms that we cannot handle, let's make sure that the storm does not handle us, but that we handle the storm. And the way we handle the storm is to do what these disciples did. These disciples finally came to the conclusion that they needed Jesus. Now, let me say this. Jesus should never be our last resort. He should always be our only result. And I submit to you today that had they come to Jesus earlier, they would not have had to fight with this storm as long as they did. Jesus was on board the ship. He was in the hinder part of the ship and he was asleep. St. Augustine says that when any storm in life overcomes us, it's because Jesus is still asleep in us. In other words, when you wake up Jesus, no matter what you are facing, Jesus can overcome it because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They went directly to Jesus and he says to him, Master, now this was right, he was the master and he is the master. Master means that he's in control of whatever is going on at the particular time. And there's absolutely nothing that you can bring to Jesus that he cannot handle. In fact, he enjoys us bringing him the tough stuff. <laughs> Don't bring him the easy stuff. Bring him the stuff, the tough stuff. Bring him the stuff that you, can't, you cannot handle. So they came to him and they said, Master, but then they said something here that was somewhat perplexing. They said, carries not that we perish? In other words, they says to Jesus, do you really care that we're going to perish? They had the audacity to question the love and the loyalty of Jesus. Well, let's back up for a moment because I think that all of us have been there at one time or another. And if you live long enough, there are some situations, some circumstances that you will encounter in this life that will make you wonder if the Lord really knows what's going on in your life, will make you wonder if you've fallen off of his radar. Yes, there are some situations that will uh, persuade you to ask God, Lord, do you care? Lord, do you know what's going on? Lord, what are you going to do? But you know, that's a ridiculous question to ask God. How could they dare ask him that question? Everything that they had came from Jesus. The clothes on their back was provided by Jesus. The sandals on their feet was provided by Jesus. Every meal that they ate was provided by Jesus. The money in their treasury was provided by Jesus. Somebody missed this. Let me just back it up and do a rewind. When we start to question God, let's think about what he has done for us already and what he's doing for us at that particular time. Does he still have a roof over your head? Does he really care? Does he still put a raiment on your back? Does he really care? Is he still putting food on your table? Does he really care? Is he still protecting you and blessing you every day of your life? Does he really care? Peter says, cast all your care upon him because he careth for you. Please don't ever doubt the love and the loyalty that Jesus has for you. Sometimes we try to judge his love and his loyalty by one thing. This was one thing. This storm was just one 
thing that was happening in their lives, but there were so many other good things that was happening. But sometimes the one thing can cause us to become somewhat discombobulated. So they ask him, carest not that we perish? Yes, he cared. But Jesus here, you're not to see this. There's a storm. They are caught in the throes of a storm. They are on board the ship that Jesus was on, and they are carrying out the assignment that Jesus gave them to carry out. It was Jesus who told them in Capernaum, let's go to the other side. They didn't make this decision on their own volition. Jesus did it, and yet they find themselves in a storm. Yes, Someone may ask the question, will you still have some trouble if you have Jesus on board your ship? Yes. Will you still encounter a storm if you're doing what Jesus has told you to do? Yes. Will you still have some problems even though you are a Christian and even though you are a new creature in Christ Jesus? Yes. Peter says, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that come to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But Peter says you ought to rejoice and that you are partakers of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Yes, the Lord allows some storms to come in our lives because he can teach us some things in a storm that he otherwise would have a difficult, a much difficult time trying to teach us in the calm. I can assure you that these disciples would not have learned about Jesus had the, what they're going to find out about him had not this storm came. And I submit to you that had not some storms had come in your life, you wouldn't know what you know about Jesus. But those storms came not to make you weak. They came to make you strong and to give you more enlightenment about the power and the providence of God. Now, let me back up. This storm hit. There was lightning. There was thundering. And they was running back and forth, bailing water. They was trying to roar. The waves were dashing up against the ship. And none of that woke up Jesus. But guess what did wake him up? When the disciples cried unto him, when you cry unto Jesus, Jesus can hear your voice even in the middle of a storm. When nobody else can hear you and when nobody else can do anything for you, oh, call on Jesus. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 says, the Lord says, call on me and I will answer thee. And I will show thee things that you have never seen before. No matter what God has done for you, there are some things that he can do for you that you've never seen before. And had you not had the storm that hit in your life, you would know what God can do. There are many, a multiplicity of storms that are striking people right now. And they're going to learn that God is able to take you through any kind of storm that you get in. But you got to learn how to trust him. I hear Solomon says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. But in all thy ways, he says, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Acknowledge him, call on him. They called on Jesus and Jesus answered. Jesus got up. <laughs> I like that. He, he got up. He arose. He got up. He was in the hinder part of the ship, but he got up and he walked to the front of the ship. Now he could have stilled the storm while he was in the hinder part of the ship, but he walked to the front of the ship. He took his position on the ship where he should always be at the front of the ship. I hear an old patriarch saying uh, that uh, this is the old ship of Zion and she has, lined, she has landed many a thousand 
get on board. King Jesus uh, is our captain. <laughs> get on board. Jesus walked to the front of the ship. He stood there. Winds, boisterous winds blowing, wave dashing, lightning and thundering, rain pouring down. Jesus stood there at the front of the ship. And the wind didn't recognize who he was in a human body. But oh, when he spoke, the wind recognized that voice because that voice was a voice that the wind had heard before. The wind recognized that that is the voice that called the wind into existence. For you see, the one who owns this voice held the wind in his hand and the wind would not be in existence had he not opened his hand and released the wind. This wind was under his control. Jesus had authority over this wind. This wind that's powerful enough to blow automobiles around and blow trucks around and blow 18 wheels around like they tonka toys. This wind that's able to uproot trees. This wind that's able to pick up old houses off of their foundation and shift them around. This wind, Jesus is in control of this wind. And the Bible says in verse 39 that he rebuked the wind. This word rebuke carries with it the idea of uh, a chaperone speaking to a child that has gotten a little unruly as if to say, hey, you're making up too much noise over there. You're getting too rumbustrous over there. You need to settle down. This is the way that Jesus was speaking to the wind. The word rebuke if you will, is just a synoptical word, if you will, of what Jesus, synoptic of what Jesus said to the wind. We don't have everything he said to the wind. Mark just tells us he rebuked it, <laughs> which means he told the wind in so many words, behave yourself, settle down, cut this foolishness out. And Jesus can speak to the wind in your storm and tell your wind, settle down, behave yourself. You stop doing that right now. And after he spoke to the wind, and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the grammar in the text suggests to us that the wind stopped blowing, not just, but the wind went, it stopped just that quick because that's the power of the creator. Then he looks at the sea. The sea, just the waves still dashing, even though the wind has stopped blowing, the waves is still dashing the Sea of Galilee is still troubled. The waves still have the energy that they got from the wind. And Jesus says, peace, be still. In other words, hush, stop moving. <laughs> and when he said that, the waves became placid, became tranquil, tranquil. And that was a calmness, not in just the area where the ship was. You got to get this. But it became calm all over the Sea of Galilee, which means if there was any other ship out there in a storm, their storm subsided too. And their storm subsided because they was in the vicinity of the ship that had Jesus on board. Do you not know it's a blessing just to be close to somebody that has Jesus in their life? It's a blessing to be close to a ship that's got Jesus on board. Jesus said, peace, be still, and the waves stopped dashing. And his disciples saw this, and they became fearful. His disciples was afraid because, you see, they had seen Jesus do many things on land, but they had never seen Jesus do this. In fact, they had never seen a man do what Jesus had done. That's the reason they began the inquiry among themselves. What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They had to obey him because of who he was. He was the son 
of God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the ending. All power in heaven and earth is in his divine hand. And guess what? He's the same Jesus today. For he's the same yesterday. Today and forever. And with all these storms that we see happening in 2021, and I wish I had time to name all of them, but I can not have time to name all of them. But whatever storm you in, this Jesus of this text, of this narrative today, he's able to speak peace to your storm. He's able to rebuke the contrary winds of your storm. But you got to learn how to trust him. You got to learn how to believe him. When he spoke, a calmness came over the entire sea of Galilee. In closing, I'm reminded of a story about a man who was going home from a revival. He had his daughter with him, and his daughter was driving. And as they was headed home, as time would have it, a storm came up out of nowhere. It started lightning and thundering. The rain started to pour down. The wind started to blow boisterously. Then his daughter said to her father, said, Father, you think we ought to pull over? He said, no, baby, keep on driving. And as she continued to drive, the storm intensified to the point where automobiles started to pull over, cars started to pull over, pickup trucks started to pull over, SUVs started to pull over. And the girl says, Father, do you think that we ought to pull over? The father said, no, baby. Keep on driving. She kept on driving, and the storm intensified some more. Intensified to the point where buses start pulling over. 18-wheelers started to pull over. RVs started to pull over. And the girl looked at her father and said, Father, do you think we need to pull over? It's looking pretty bad. Father said, no, baby, keep on driving. A few minutes later, she drove out of the storm. The sun was shining, the sky was blue, the winds were calm, and it was tranquil. And then her father looked at her and said, daughter, said, pull over. She said, daddy, pull over. We just come through a horrific storm. The wind almost blew us off of the highway. I couldn't hardly see through all the rain that was coming down. And you telling me to pull over? He says, yes. She pulled over. She said, now, Father, why do you want me to pull over? He says, now, look back. When she looked back, he said, now, I want you to notice that everybody that pulled over in the storm, they are still in the storm. But the reason why we are out of the storm. And the reason why we are in a tranquil, calm environment is because we kept on pushing. <laughs> I want to close by telling everybody that I know we're in some storms now. We're in an economic storm. We're in a high unemployment storm. We're in a COVID-19 COVID storm. We're in an insurrection storm. And I could go on to name some other storms, but keep on pushing. For we will come out of a storm. I think that's what the songwriter was alluding to when he said, though the storms keep on raging in my life. And sometimes it's hard to tell the night from the day. But that hope that lies within me, it reassures. <laughs> As I cast my eyes upon the peaceful shore. I know that he will lead me safely to that blessed place that he has prepared. But if the storm don't cease, and if the winds keep on blowing, my soul has been anchored in the Lord. Billows may roll, breakers may dash, but I shall not sway because he holds me fast. And though dark the day, no clouds in the sky, I know it's all right because Jesus is nigh. My soul has been anchored 
in the load. Am I talking to somebody today? No matter what 2021 20, looks like, you console yourself. You encourage yourself by telling yourself, my soul has been anchored in the load. God bless you. Happy 2021. Greetings. If you would like to give or offer donations to our church electronically, simply download the Giveify app via App Store if you have an iPhone or Google Play Store if you have an Android device. Next, search for the Greater New Prospect Baptist Church located at 14020 West Richmond Street, Meadville, Texas 77461. It will have a purple logo on it as well as a green check mark to verify that it is a valid account. Next, you are to create an account and then begin your donations or make your offerings. Thank you. Blessings. Additionally, you may also send donations to P.O. Box 525, Naperville, Texas 77461. Members may continue to link to contribute tithes and offerings to Greater New Prospect Church via Pony Mail or by visiting the campus between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. May God bless.